Well, good morning, guys, and uh, welcome to the Odyssey Church. I think most of you already know me, but if you don't, shame on you. My name is Joyce Ward, <laughs> and I'm the music director here at the Odyssey Church, and I'm doing the welcome this morning. And I want to let everyone know that I'm thankful for everyone who showed up here this morning. It's good to see so many familiar faces here this morning, and of course, some new ones. And if today is your first time, or maybe your second or third, or maybe this is your 56th time. I don't think we've ever had that many services, but uh, <laughs> but if you're here, I I just want to welcome you to welcome you here this morning. Um, we have a big vision from God, and we we know that we can't do it in our own head. We need your help to fill the vision. We have a great team of people, and maybe you've already noticed, but this isn't much about a church. If you come and believe you're part of something much bigger than a church, you are the church. You're a member of the body of Christ a living, changing, growing representative of Jesus here on earth. In your bulletins that you guys have gotten, if you don't have one, they're right there right by the door. Um, there are connection cards. And if you're new, we invite you guys to fill one of those out and, of course, turn it in when the offering plate comes by or drop them into the basket before you guys leave here today. Um, on there, we want you to include your name and your mailing address, and we're not going to go to your house. We promise. We just, um, we just need your mailing address if you're interested in us mailing stuff to you. And of course, your um, email address and a phone number to best reach you at. Now, while you're filling out the cards, um, I want to explain why we do this every week. First, we'd like to know who's here, but it's also so we can get to know you and, and the information to help you know what's going on so you can get connected with us, just like yourself, so you can know us. I know I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but it bears repeating that one of the biggest concerns that we've seen in churches is people who don't know how to get connected to the church and people in the churches. So our desire here at the Odyssey Church is to help people help and find Jesus. So we want to make it as easy as possible to get connected to Christ. We want you to know that God loves you and we love you. And we want God to use us and use you to lead people into a deep relationship of Jesus Christ. Please bow your heads. Dear God, I'm thankful for all, all that you have gathered here this morning. It's no accident that nobody is here. I pray that the service goes well and that the, when Pastor Rob t comes up to preach his message and that um, the words and the message may be received, whether it be through his sermon or through the music. God, I, I thank you for this day that you've given. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, please join us and joy to the world. Y'all can stand.
After 400 years, God speaks. And he doesn't come by opening the heavens. And he doesn't come in his might. And he doesn't come in his power. And he doesn't come with a thundering voice. And he doesn't come as a judge. But he comes with the cries of a baby. Jesus comes in an unexpected way. Jesus comes at an unexpected time. Jesus comes to an unexpected people. And when he comes, the unexpected happens. After 400 years, God speaks through the cries of a baby. And not just any baby. God's people had waited for generations. They waited for generations. They had waited for 400 years for God to reveal himself. But they could have never imagined that their rescue and their redemption would have come in the form of a baby. A baby changes everything. A baby born on the radar, a baby that was born into chaos and into confusion, into a world filled with sin, into a world that was in need of a Savior. Announced by 12 words, 12 words that changed all of history, 12 words that changed the course of humanity, 12 words that even changed the way we measure all of history. A Savior has been born unto you. He is Christ the Lord. <coughs> this is the greatest story that's ever been told. And we can't add anything to it. I can't give you any new information today. I can't tell you anything that you've not already heard. This story isn't true because it's wonderful. It's not new because it's wonderful. It's wonderful because it's absolutely true. It is an event in history. So may the Lord awaken our hearts this morning to old truth. Father, we pray to you today. We pray that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds to the old truth. Father, may we once again see Christmas as it was meant to be, as you intended to be. Father, sometimes we think when we ask why Jesus came, we, we use the, the scriptural answers. He came to be born so you can dwell, and that's true. He came to go to the cross, and that's true. He came to give us eternal life, and that's true. But yet the ultimate reason that you came was for me and for those that are gathered here and for all the people. Ultimately, the reason you came is for us. So may our hearts be awakened to that truth this morning. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. Louis Giglio says it, and I'm paraphrasing this. Louis Giglio says that sometimes we need to turn ourselves into little children. Amen. And just sit and wonder as we hear this awesome, this true story. The greatest story, the greatest event in all of history. God became man. The infinite became infant. Now I'm going to be reading out of the Gospel of Luke this morning, chapter 2. And we're going to begin in verse 1. We're going to read through chapter 20. Normally I read through the New Living Translation, but today uh, I just like the reading as it comes from the 1984 version of the NIV. So I'm going to be reading out of the NIV, but I'm going to be reading out of the, the earlier edition. I'm going to begin in verse 1 of chapter 2. And as I'm doing that, I want you to think about this. You know, I want you to think about uh, what Micah proclaimed 700 years before Jesus was even born. Micah was an Old Testament prophet. And he wrote down, and it's been recorded for us for thousands of years, an ancient transcript that we put into our Bibles. And he recorded in the book that's named after him, Michael chapter 5, verse 2, this prophecy. He said, But you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over all of Israel whose origins are from old, who will come for me, I'm sorry, from ancient times, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. 
700 years before Jesus was even born, the prophet Micah predicted exactly where he would be born. <coughs> Luke starts out in chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census would be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that would take place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And while everyone went to his own hometown to register, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, as prophesied by Micah, to the town of David because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Some of you may think that it's by accident you're here this morning. Some of you may think that you came here on purpose. You came to hear Mackenzie sing. You came because this is where you thought you should be this morning. But have you thought about what an amazing thing it was that God ordained the Messiah to be born in Bethlehem? That in order for God to bring two, what appeared to be the world, two insignificant people, to the town of Bethlehem for that first Christmas, that God put it in the heart of Augustus Caesar, or Caesar Augustus, that all the Roman world should enroll for a census, each one to his own hometown. See, without us even knowing it, God will move the heavens and move the earth and use whatever it takes to bring you to him. His message to our hearts. See, he's a big God for a small people. He will do his part, but we must do our part. We have to open our hearts and, his, and our minds to hear his message. And we have great reasons to celebrate the peace and the hope and the joy and the love that Christ offers us because as Proverbs 21.1 says, the king's heart is like a stream of, think about this, the king's heart is like a stream of water that is directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he wants. God will move empires to bless his children. God starts out by doing the unexpected. He moves one of the greatest empires in the entire world, the greatest empire the world had known up to that point in time. He stirs the heart of the Roman emperor himself to bring his gift of salvation to the world. And look what day it was. It was tax day. Now you would think, and I speak as a fool, you would think that if God was going to speak after being quiet for 400 years, that he would choose a nice, calm, peaceful day so everybody could hear him. So that people didn't have things to distract their minds. So they, they weren't busy with other things. But he comes at what seems like the worst possible time in our human minds. He came on tax day. There were, there were probably at least a million people in a small town of Bethlehem that normally just had maybe tens of thousands of people. It was a day of confusion. It was a day of chaos when people were distracted by the things of the world. Yet the first thing we see this morning is God is still sovereign. He can and he will use everything and everybody to accomplish his will. See, Caesar Augustus thought that he was taking a census to build up his power, to build up his strength, to build up his uh, kingdom. And all along, God was using this man to build up God's kingdom and God's power and God's strength. See, Caesar and Rome, they thought that they, the whole world revolved around them. Mary and Joseph wouldn't have even been noticed by most people. They were insignificant in the eyes of the world. They just came to town because the Roman emperor had ordered them to. They came to town in obedience to a decree. And yet, God takes someone that the world thought was the most powerful man in the entire world and he creates the greatest event in all of human history when that young girl gave birth to a child. So I want you to know this morning, if you're feeling insignificant, if you're feeling like the world doesn't notice you, if you're feeling like you don't matter, if you feel like your life is in chaos, if you feel like your life is in confusion, 
confusion, if you have your attention elsewhere, then maybe, just maybe, God has you here for a reason. Maybe God has you here so he can tell you just how much he loves you. That he loved you so much that he came to earth in the form of man to be with you. So that you could know him. Maybe in all the chaos, maybe in all the distraction that goes on at this time of year, God is in the background and he's crying out for you. Just as a baby that could change everything for you. He went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. I want you to imagine, maybe for a moment, that uh, either you're Joseph or you're Mary, and you're on that donkey, and you're riding the 80 or 90 miles to Bethlehem. And you're seven or eight months, maybe even nine months pregnant, and you're riding in the heat on the back of a donkey. Now, can you imagine what she must have been praying? Lord, Lord, don't let me have this baby. Don't let me have this baby in Bethlehem. Let me get back to my home, please. I've done everything you've asked me to do. Please don't let me have this baby now. And when they got to town and there was no room for him in the inn, and she looked around that stable, and she saw where she was going to have to be sleeping, can you imagine what she must have been begging God for? I mean, you think a God that could move an entire Roman Empire, that could change the mind or put into the mind of Caesar Augustus, that hold the census, could make room for two people in the end? You know, so again, I, you know, if you're here, and maybe you've been asking God for something, and you've been asking him for a long time, and he hasn't answered your prayers, or maybe he's answered your prayers in a way that you didn't expect. Maybe you think he's not answering them all. Because I'm sure that Mary and Joseph that day would have preferred to stay in the end. I, I think they would have preferred not to go to Bethlehem at all. And you know they had to be thinking, God, we have done every single thing you've asked us to do. This is the hardest thing that anybody can imagine. And I've done it, and I haven't complained, and yet look what you've done to me. Look at the circumstances I'm in. And if, you that, if that's you this morning, just, just look closely at the picture, because when we look closely, this is what we see. We, we see a God who did not give Mary and Joseph everything that they wanted, but he gave them absolutely everything that they needed. When Mary and Joseph had done everything they could do in their power, God supplied everything else in his power. God may not have given them everything they wanted, but he certainly gave them everything that he needed or that they needed. And do you think because maybe you're, you're experiencing some kind of adversity or you're experiencing some kind of problem that God is not in control of your life, that he's not behind the scenes working and still in control? He came on that first Christmas day when it wasn't convenient. He came in the middle of chaos. He came in the middle of confusion. He came in the middle of turmoil. God did the unexpected. He came at an unexpected time and in an unexpected way. See, when you're following God's will for your life, it doesn't necessarily mean we're guaranteed a comfortable life. If I'm truthful with you, my life has been a lot more uncomfortable after I began following Jesus than it was before I followed Jesus. Hallelujah. But we're not guaranteed a comfortable life, but we are promised, we are guaranteed that God has a plan for our life, even in our discomfort. It wasn't a convenient time. It wasn't a convenient place. But God is still sovereign. See, the thing is, God does not seek our prosperity. God seeks our heart. And in order for us, for him to get our heart, sometimes he has to put us in an uncomfortable place. Luke goes on in verse 6. While they were there, the time came for a baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. As Mackenzie just sang, teenage girl, much too young, unprepared for what's to come. 
A baby changes everything. God did the unexpected. God came at an unexpected time. God came to an unexpected people. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I, I say this most sincerely. Angels have to be scary things. I mean, you think about this. Every single time in Scripture when an angel appears to a person, I don't mean the angels are unaware that are spoken of in Hebrew, but when they shine and they come, every single time the first words are out of their mouth is, do not be afraid. Now why do they say do not be afraid? Because if an angel appeared in front of you, and, but I would be terrified. I would probably have to go home and change my clothes. And who do the angels first appear to? I mean, it's not to who I would think they would appear to. He doesn't appear to the mighty. They don't appear to the powerful. They don't appear to the educated. They don't even appear to the religious people. You know, if I was God and I speak as a fool again, if I was God, I would come to the religious people first. But who does he come to? He comes to the lowly shepherds. And sometimes we read that and we say, well, he just came to shepherds. And we don't realize that shepherds were considered to be so unspiritually clean that the sheep they were raising would be slaughtered into the temple, sacrificed in the temple. They weren't even allowed to go into the temple and worship. They were so spiritually unclean that they weren't allowed to testify in court. They were the lowest of the low. And I think maybe God came and announced the birth of a Savior of Christ the Lord to the angel, to the shepherds first, because if he could come to shepherds, he could come to rock. He could come to you. Amen. Doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you're doing right now. Amen. He can come to you. Amen. Verse 10 says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. And sometimes I have to remind myself, I try to remind you, isn't that what we're called to do as the Odyssey Church? As the local church, not the big C, but the little C, as our local church, the Odyssey Church, we're to bring the good news of great joy to every single person that we meet. We had a candlelight service later last night, and as we lit the candle... And then we lit a candle off of the candle. Nothing was taken away from the candle that we used to light the other candle, but together they shine brighter. Isn't that what we're to do? Take the light of Christ out into the world? We don't lose anything by that. We just gain by it. We're to bring the good news of great joy to all the people. We're to do it as a church. We're to do it individually. It's good news that brings great joy, not to a few people, not to some people, not to most people, but to all the people. And some people think, you know, and this is where this world has done. Some people think the, 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 the Bible is just a fairy tale. It's just a bunch of, of stories. Some people think the Bible is uh, full of a lot of rules that restrict them and keep them from doing what they want to do. Some people think that reading the Bible is boring and it's a waste of time. But it's not. It's good news. That's the literal translation of the word good news or the word gospel. The literal translation of the word gospel is good news. It's the good news that brings great joy. And if we're not experiencing great joy, if we're not experiencing this great joy in our life, then maybe, just maybe, it's because we disconnected ourselves from the good news that brings great joy for all the people. You know, I hope that everyone here today can experience the powerful message of Christmas because it's for everybody. Nobody has to be left out. It's good news for all the people. It took me a long time to realize that God doesn't love me because I'm good and have it all together. God doesn't love you because you're good and you have it all together. He loves you because he's good 
And he has it all together. Amen. Jesus knew when he came we were sinful people. He wouldn't have to come if we weren't in sin. There's no need to have a Savior if you don't need to be saved from anything. That's right. He didn't come with a promise to keep us from our sin. He came with a promise to forgive us for our sin. In spite of our past. In spite of our sin. In spite of our circumstances. In spite of our questions. Jesus came to all of us. And it's good news of great joy. And what is this good news that brings great joy? Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And he is both Christ and Lord. God did the unexpected. He came in an unexpected way. He came to an unexpected people. And when he came, the unexpected happened. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And then suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts. I've read that there were hundreds of thousands of angels. That's what they mean by heavenly hosts. This great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. There was praising. There was the praising of God. There was singing. There was scripture being quoted. We think about this, and we sometimes read it la la la, but when you read these words, we have to understand this is all we need for both this world and the next world. This is the greatest story, the greatest event that has ever taken place. So let me ask you this question. How has the Christmas story affected your life? Has the Christmas story affected your life? Has it been good news of great joy to your heart? Or, or is there no room in the end of your heart for Jesus? Have you sort of crowded him out with business, busyness? Have you sort of let your circumstances, your problems, your adversities, let your heart get so full that there, there's no room for Jesus? See, Jesus comes to us as a baby. The angels came, and men and women trembled. When the angels came, the first words out of their mouth was, Do not be afraid. People were terrified. But Jesus, Jesus comes to us like a little baby. Because who's afraid of a little baby? You said, I'm insignificant. Jesus came for you. You say, I'm too scared? Jesus came for you. You say, I have too much anxiety. I, I have too much fear in my life. I have too much depression in my life. Jesus came for you. You say, I'm so sinful that I don't even belong in church. You're just the person. Jesus came. Jesus came for you. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Now, I, I read that. And I'm like, duh. <laughs> Angel just appeared, told me where Jesus was. Well, of course I'm going to go to Bethlehem. But who? Isn't that what the scripture's telling us this morning? <coughs> Isn't this what has been recorded in human history, been passed down through the years? I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. But have we gone see him? The Jewish nation was expecting a Messiah. They just didn't expect him to come as a baby. The Jewish nation was expecting a Messiah. They were expecting him to come as a king, though. They were expecting a king, and instead, they got a savior. God provided what they needed.
but he didn't provide it the way they wanted. He didn't provide it the way they expected. God did the unexpected. God came in an unexpected way, at an unexpected time, to an unexpected people, and when he did, the unexpected happened. And maybe, like he did for me for many years, God has appeared to you. He has come into your life, and you don't recognize him because he didn't come like you expected him to come. Maybe God has given you everything that you need, but it's not what or how you want it. I'm going to challenge you today to let God do the unexpected in your life. See, we don't have, here's the great part about it. We don't have to negotiate our sin with God. We think we have to be so good and we have to do this and we have to do this. And what we're doing then is we're telling God, I'll be good so you love me. We don't have to negotiate our sin with God. Jesus came so our sin could be forgiven. See, things can be good between us and God. Things can be reconciled between us and God. Not because of what we have done but because of what he has done on our behalf. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. So they, the shepherds, hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? When we see Jesus? When we see him, this baby that changes everything, this Savior that has been born to us, this Christ, this Lord, aren't we supposed to spread the word concerning what God has revealed to us so that others will hear it and be amazed as well. To be like Mary, but Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. Again, I, I sometimes visualize things. I, you know, the angels came to Mary and said, the Holy Spirit has come upon you and that you're pregnant. And Mary knew that she'd never been with a man, and yet she was pregnant. And, and, and the angel comes to Joseph and tells him what's going on. In obedience, Mary and Joseph were together, and she's pregnant. But I don't think it really dawned on them all that was going on until she held that baby in her arms. And she realized that baby was going to change everything that not just they knew, but the world knew. It must have dawned on her at that moment that the Rescuer, the Savior, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, He's here, and He's come to me. It must have overwhelmed her when she came to that revelation, when she came to that realization. Maybe that's you this morning. You know, for the first time, you begin to see Jesus, and it's become overwhelming to you, and you're pondering these things in your heart. What should we do when we see God? My prayer is that you're going to return just as the shepherds did and that you will do the unexpected. The shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I've been praying this week for each person that's here. I may not know you. I may not know you were here. God did. I've been praying that as you leave here today, when you return home, that you will glorify God, that you will praise Him for all that you have seen in her. Not just here, but through the revelation of Jesus Christ. A baby that changes everything, if that baby is Jesus. See, sometimes we think Christmas celebrates a day. Christmas celebrates a holiday. But it doesn't. Christmas celebrates a true event in the history of mankind. We just get our Bibles in, and we just turn the page from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Just as simple as turning the page. Yes, that's not the way it happened in history. There was 400 years 
of nothing but silence between God and his people. 400 years there was no prophet. 400 years there was no voice from God. 400 years there was no thus saith the Lord. Absolutely nothing. Just silence from God Almighty to his people. Not for four years. Not for 40 years. But for 400 years. Nothing of silence. Nothing of prophecies. Nothing. No signs. No wonders. No nothing. Just silence. Imagine you sitting around the fire with your, your father and you, you ask him, say, Dad, have you ever heard from God? He says, no, son. I've never heard from God. Dad, did this God that you tell me about, this God that we read about in the temple, did your dad ever hear from God? No, son. My dad never heard from God. What about his dad? Did, did, did my grandpa, did my great grandfather ever hear from God? No, we haven't heard from God in a long, long time. I mean, wouldn't you wonder, at least begin to wonder, is, is God there at all? Or maybe he is there, but he just don't care about me. Or maybe if he's there and he's not speaking to you, maybe he's mad at you. You begin to wonder. But then all of a sudden, in the silence, God does the unexpected. He comes to you at an unexpected time. He comes to you in an unexpected way. He comes to an unsuspecting people. And when he does, God comes and the unexpected happens. Not through a sign, not through a prophetic moment, not through a burning bush, but gently. Like he's a newborn baby. God came out of heaven as a helpless baby. The infinite became infinite. God breaks his silence after 400 years with the cry of a baby in the middle of the night. He took off his robes. He took off his glory of heaven and put on the clothes of flesh and came to earth. And he knew what he would find when he got here. He would find a people in need of a Savior. He would find people that were broken. People that were living in chaos. People that were living in confusion. People that were weary. People that were tired. People that were living in darkness. God came out of heaven. Emmanuel, which means God with us. And what day did he choose to break his silence? Was it a day of peace? Was it in a place where it was business as usual? Or was it in a time of chaos and confusion? It was tax day. The craziest day of the year. It was a stressful day. And I want you to think about Mary and Joseph who had been traveling day and night. They'd gotten in town too late. There was no place for them to stay. And they had a cloud over their head, okay? We, we read this, and we just sometimes just read it, and we, we don't pay attention to the de details. Mary was pregnant, and she wasn't married. <coughs> and can you imagine when she tried to explain her pregnancy? They knock on the door. Oh, you're pregnant. Joseph, so... No, that's not my baby. Right? He says, no, no, that's not his. Um, I, I'm... Um, I'm still a virgin. Um, it was the Holy Spirit. Uh, God made me pregnant. Uh, and, and by the way, by the way, uh, you all haven't heard from him in 400 years. But I have. And he got me pregnant. Now we sort of laugh at that. But do you know how much it would take for Kayla to convince me that God got her pregnant and not her boyfriend? <laughs> How much would it take for your daughter to convince you that God got her pregnant and not her boyfriend? We just take that in stride. That innkeeper probably had a room in the back and he goes, mm -hmm. God, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, there's no room here. I used to sleep out in the stable, okay? <laughs> we sort of get that today. You know, those of us who believe the Bible, the virgin birth, the incarnation, God coming in flesh, but on that night. I don't think she could have convinced many people. They were under suspicion. 
There was nothing perfect about that night except the baby and the message that the angel had spoken. The 12 words of Christmas that changed the world and the course of all humanity. The 12 words of Christmas that the angels that brought that night that could change your life. That could change the course of where you're headed. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And, 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 and look at who the Savior is born to. He was born. He wasn't, it doesn't say he was born to Mary. It doesn't say he was born to Mary and Joseph. It says a Savior has been born to you. A, a Savior has been born to Rob. A, a Savior has been born to Mackenzie. A, a Savior has been born to Denise. A Savior has been born to Yvonne. Kyle. Eddie. Savior has been born to you. To us a Savior is born. Christ the Lord. This is where Christmas becomes very, very personal. We get wrapped up in Christmas this year, this time of year, and we think that we're to go out and buy and give to everything else, but Christmas should be came. Millions of people believe that Christ came and they are lost in their sin. It's not enough to know that Christ came for somebody else. You've got to get to the point. In your walk with Jesus where you know that Christ came for you. <coughs> you know, for some people, Christmas can be a very comforting time. But I bet on that very first night, Christmas wasn't comforting to Mary. Eight or ninety miles on, a, on the back of a donkey under suspicion, under condemnation. About to give birth in a stable, no place to even lay the baby except in a feeding trough. In a town full of turmoil and chaos and confusion, her whole life was up in turmoil. That's the way it is with so many people this time of year. This is the way it is with so many people in our world. Some people are unable to absorb the message because their lives are in so much turmoil. Is that you today? It, it, it was me. I, I admit to that. Maybe you have somebody in your life or you know somebody has a serious illness. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe your business is failing. Maybe your marriage is in trouble. Maybe you're just depressed and it won't go away. Is there something in your life that's just bad and you just don't know what to do about it? Your life is in chaos. Your life is in confusion. There are some things that have happened and you just don't understand. But I want you to know you're just the person who Jesus came from. He's the baby that can change everything. The 12 words of Christmas. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now as we begin to close, I, I want you to think about what this doesn't say. We know what it says. Think about what it doesn't say. The angels did not make this proclamation. The angels didn't say, hey, you're a mess. You get it all together, then this Savior can be for you. The angel didn't say, listen, I want you to try hard to get it right. And when you do, then you can have this Savior that has been born. The angel didn't say, wait till all is well in your life. And then you can have this Savior. See, he did the unexpected, but he did it for you. He came at an unexpected time. He came in an unexpected way. He came to an unexpected people. And when he did... The unexpected happened. See, God never told us he would give us everything we wanted. But he did promise us some things. He did guarantee us some things. He said, I'll give you everything that you need. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And that is really all we need in this world or the next world. A Savior who is both Christ and Lord. But as we read the scriptures, we find out God gave us so much more than that. He says he's beside us. We forget sometimes he is the present day God, not just the child that was born 2,000 years ago. Not just the God who created everything seen and unseen, but he is in our very presence today. He says he'll be right beside us. He said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He promises His grace will be sufficient for us. He promises to meet all our needs. He promises us the amazing gift of eternal life if we will just accept 
the indescribable gift that he's given us, Jesus Christ. A Savior who has been born to you, he is Christ the Lord. Emmanuel, God with us, the, the baby that changes everything. John, who was one of Jesus' closest friends on earth, one of the ones they call the inner circle, he writes in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14 of the first chapter, he goes on and said, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I really love the way the message translates that verse. It says, The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> See, it didn't look like God was at work that night in Bethlehem. But He was there and He was doing a great and mighty work. And it may not look like God is at work in your life. But he is there. He's doing a great work in your life as well. And your life may look crazy. And it may be full of chaos. And it may be full of confusion. And you may hurt. And you may be weary. And you may be tired. And you may be broken. But if that's you, I want you to know, just like that first Christmas light, the glory of God is shining all around you. And God is saying to you, I love you. I love you. I love you with an everlasting love. And that's why I came. Because I knew it was impossible for you to come to me. So I came to you. In the darkness, I'm coming to you. In the hurt, I'm coming to you. In the pain, I'm coming to you. In the valley of the shadow of death, I'm coming to you. Wherever you are, I will come to you. I may do the unexpected. And I may come at an unexpected time. But when I come... The unexpected will happen. After 400 years, God appeared. Was he dead? No, he wasn't dead. He is the living God. Emmanuel, God with us, who came to earth as a baby. Was he mad at you? No, he loves you way too much to be mad at you. Does he care about you? Of course he does. That's why he came. He came to save you. Does he always come at a convenient time? No. Does he always come when there's no problems in your life? No. But he comes. And maybe that's where you are this morning. And here's what God wants you to know about Christmas. The Savior has been born to you. To you. And he is Christ the Lord. A baby changes everything if that baby is Jesus Christ our Lord. Maybe there's somebody here today that's just saying, hey, what do I have to do to get this baby that changes everything? Well, here's the good news. Here's the gospel. You don't have to do anything. I said, just ask him into your heart. Just say, Jesus, I need you to save me from this mess I'm in. Or maybe you, you just have to say, Lord, I just need to know, Jesus, that you're still in charge. My, my life is crazy. It's chaotic. It's in confusion. I need to know that you're still in charge. Will you please come into my heart and take over my life? Or maybe you're just feeling empty. Like, Lord, I have this hole in my heart. I just need you to come into it and fill it. 2,000 years ago, God sent his gift into the world. And he didn't do it by opening the heavens. And he didn't do it in his might. And he didn't do it in his power. And he didn't do it with a thundering voice. And he didn't do it as a judge. He sent a Savior. But you're never going to experience the hope and the love and the joy and the peace that the Christmas gift has to offer until you receive it. What good is the gift that's left under the tree? Emmanuel, God with us. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. The last verse of the song that Mackenzie sung to us. My whole life has turned around. I was lost, but now I'm found. A baby changes everything. A baby. God bless you all. I pray that you will receive the true gift of Christmas this year. And if you're still not sure how to receive that gift, 
please see me or Jennifer or Bryce or Mackenzie or any of those that were on stage today or any of you see walking around here. If they don't know, they'll bring you to me. We love you. We pray that 2015, God will give you more than you can imagine. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what is Paul describes as the indescribable gift. The gift of Jesus Christ, a Savior who has been born not just to the world, but to each one of us individually. Lord, let us see in our hearts that a Savior has been born to us, to me, to everyone in this room, and that He is Christ the Lord. And may we leave here today pondering these things in our heart, glorifying you, and telling others what we have seen and heard. Father, we thank you for the offer and the gift of eternal salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ, who came as a baby that can change everything. Amen. Amen. God bless you all, and may you have peace and joy and health in 2015. Thank you for coming. I hope to see you next time.